Welcome to Bible Track Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracks Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracks, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracks Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracks and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Hello, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us today here in the broadcast. Thank you for wanting to, well, do what the Bible says, grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is my hope and prayer that our time together here in Bible Tract Echoes does help you grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also, along the way, want to strengthen you in your personal evangelism. And to that end, we give out gospel tracts. That word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. We have gospel tracks, and for 80-plus years, we've been publishing them, giving them away free of charge all over the world. We'd love to give you a free sample pack out of our gospel tracks. I've got one in my hand that I'm going to emphasize and urge you, uh, using it to urge you to get the gospel tracks from us, but I'll say more about that here in just a moment. We are at the beginning stages of a new series of studies here on the broadcast, and these messages deal with the subject of prophecy. Now, for some folk, they love prophecy, and others, well, they don't like it very much at all. But far too many people, and I'm talking about believers, people who love the Bible, love Christ, they think prophecy is too confusing and too divisive. Well, my thoughts are that prophecy is exactly the opposite of all all that. It gives hope. It gives comfort. Plus, it's a strong encourager of our involvement in the lives of lost people to share with them the gospel. My title for this series on prophecy is this, Making Prophecy Plain. I really have borrowed my title from a statement made by God out of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. There's where God told the prophet Habakkuk to make the prophecy he gave to him very plain. Habakkuk had a critical prophetic message, and God wanted the people to understand it. So God told the prophet to make his message plain, make it clear, and that's my goal. Today, I'll primarily, as I said, be in Matthew chapter 24. So get your Bible, join me there with pen and paper ready, please. With that pen and paper handy, you'll be prepared when at the end of the broadcast, my announcer gives our contact information. You can choose one of three ways by which you can give us your name and mailing address. We'll send you a free sample packet containing one each of all of the English gospel tracts that we publish. One of those is this one in my hand. It's entitled, It is Free. It is free. You know that salvation is free to sinners. Now, it cost Jesus his life. He died on the cross. He was buried and rose again. That is part, that is a critical foundation of the gospel message. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and rose again but thereby by him paying our sin debt, he can offer salvation, forgiveness of sin to you and me free of charge. And that's exactly what this gospel track does. This gospel track, it is free, opens up, and it does not have paragraphs in a story. On the left-hand side, it just simply asks, what is free? The answer, salvation is free. And there are five Bible verses that say that salvation is a gift of God. On the right-hand side, of the gospel track as it's open, you're going to find this question. Where can I find it? Where can I find this free gift? Answer, in God's risen son. And there's four Bible verses there which explain that salvation is in the person of Jesus Christ. At the bottom, there is in a box this verse, one of my favorite verses of all time from Hebrews 1, 3. It says, when he, speaking of Christ, had by himself purged or cleansed our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, if you turn this to the back panel, the gospel tract tells you how to receive Christ as Savior. It's a great 
tool to use in explaining the gospel one-on-one with a lost person. Get it from us. If you can go to our website, by the way, our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. And remember, I said the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S, BibleTracksInc.org. If your Bible's open to Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 says this, And as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying, When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Jumping down to verse 27 now. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I'm over now to verses 36 and 37. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We'll just stop with the reading of those verses there. Now, on Monday's broadcast, I used 1 Peter 1, 11, and I said that I think that that verse, 1 Peter 1, 11, summarizes all of God's prophecies about the coming of Messiah. He will come to do two things, suffer and to bring glory. When Jesus was born, he came the first time, he came to suffer, and suffer he did at Calvary. When he came to give his life, he came to give his life as a ransom price for many, the book of Mark chapter 10 says. Now, right before Jesus ascended back to heaven after rising from the dead, Jesus promised he would come again. That means that there is going to be a second coming. That, by the way, is all found in the book of Acts chapter 1 where Jesus ascends there and the angels tell the disciples that Jesus will return just as he left. So that being said, there are two basic opinions about Jesus' second coming. Opinion number one says this, that the world's going to get better and better, and due to the work of God's people to change the culture and change the hearts of people, and when the world is morally and ethically right, Jesus will then come. Opinion number two says that the world's going to get worse and worse. And when the world gets to a particular time and particular place of wickedness, Jesus will come and he himself will clean house and make the world right. Jesus will make the world right by himself, by his own power, not by human hand. Now, which of those views is right? Well, if my goal of this series is to make prophecy plain, then I need to ask myself, is there a prophetic portion of Scripture that tells us which of the views is right? And I think, yes, there is, and it's here in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. Notice three things. First of all, notice the questions that have come up here in Matthew 24, verse 3. I use the word questions because I really think there's two questions here. One question is this, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Now, remember, they're talking to Jesus. He's presently with them, but he's, he is going to come again. So they say, what shall be the sign of thy coming, thy second coming? The other question is, when shall these things be? Now, these two questions are what Matthew 24 and 25 are all about. So those are the questions. That's number one. The second thing I want you to see is the conditions. The conditions. What will things be like when Jesus returns the second time? Well, I read verses 36 and 37. I think they're quite clear. Verse 36 says that nobody knows the date of his second coming. Now, some people have set dates and ended up looking foolish. Others have tried to play games, word games, with the words day and hour. They say, well, we can't know the day and hour, but we can know the season. We got to have a few weeks of time here, and that's when Jesus is going to return. My friend, stay away from those kind of people, would you please? Nobody knows. Jesus said, nobody knows, so I guess nobody knows. But look at verse 37. Verse 37 gives us a basic condition of the time when Jesus returns. It will be a time like of Noah's day. Now, the story of Noah from Genesis 6 tells of an era of perversion, of lawlessness, and utter wickedness. 
That does not sound like a day of societal perfection and societal bliss, if you ask me. Jesus said his second coming will occur in an era of moral corruption. So, view number one, for me, does not seem to fit the plain statement of Scripture. Add to this that here in chapter 24 and verses 29 and 30, there Jesus' return will come at the end of the tribulation period, not in the day of perfection and beauty. Let me read you verses 29 and 30. They say this, I'm quoting now, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun, the S-U-N, be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, did you hear all that? Did you see all that? Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation period, and it says, all the tribes of the earth shall mourn, not rejoice, but mourn. Here's one final thought. What are the consequences of Jesus' second coming? If I were to turn over to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, there Jesus says that he will come, and when he comes, he will judge sinners and cast sinners into everlasting fire. But Christ will also bless believers. Again, Matthew 25 verse 34 talks about his blessing believers. It says, and I'm reading now, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. Oh, one final reference, please. This one from the last book of the Bible, the book of the Revelation, chapter 19 and verse 15. Did you write it down? Revelation 19, 15. A major consequence of Jesus' return will be that he, he, not people, he will set up his millennial reign on earth. The word millennial means 1,000 years. If you don't believe that Jesus will return a second time to earth, I'm going to make this very statement here. It may be a little blunt. It may be a little straightforward, but I need to make it. If you don't believe that Jesus will return a second time to earth, then you have denied the clear statements of the Bible and you have rejected Jesus' own promise. Again, that's blunt, I know. But you can't, you cannot call yourself a Christian and then deny Jesus' bodily return to earth. And by the way, you can't be a Christian and deny his bodily resurrection either. Those two things, one has passed and done very openly. The second will happen, his second coming to earth to set up his kingdom. It'll be done openly and all the tribes of the earth because of their sinfulness will mourn. Why can you not reject it? Because Jesus has made it plain. When you and I take the plain statements of scripture and believe what they plainly do say, you and I will then have to believe the word of God, adjust our life, and then share that with others. Because Jesus will return and judge sinners and bless the righteous, let's tell sinners how to be saved and be blessed by the Savior of the world. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309 309- 828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website, our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.